Help Pastor John Kubo. <laughs> yeah, so. Born in Kaduna, Nigeria during the Civil War to parents from Edo State in Nigeria, okay. his father was Catholic and his mom Muslim. He got saved initially at the Assemblies of God Church in Kaduna in 1977, but rededicated his life to Christ and walked with God in 1984. He attended secondary school at Government College Kaduna and medical school at the University of Ibadan, Nigeria. He has been involved in Christian ministry since 1984 till today by the grace of God. He started training in orthopedic surgery in Nigeria in 1992. He was the first recipient of the World Orthopedic Concern WOC, International Fellowship to study orthopedic surgery in India in 1995. He subsequently trained in Malaysia and at Emory University School of Medicine in Atlanta. He is a board certified orthopedic surgeon and currently the head of orthopedic surgery at the Atlanta Veterans Administration Medical Center. He is a teacher and a clinician and above all a child of God. He is married to Tolupe, the most beautiful woman God created since Eve. And since 1997, they are blessed with four children. He is an ordained pastor in the Redeemed Christian Church of God and was ordained into ministry in 1998. Since then, he has served faithfully under the provincial and assistant regional pastor, Pastor Johnson Adefilia, at Family Praise Chapel in Decatur. His primary calling and gifting is to teach. He is very passionate about teaching, encouraging, and modeling behavior for both singles and married couples. Thank you, media. So that was the bio for Dr. Joe. So ladies and gentlemen, City of David. Let's rise on our feet and give a resounding welcome to Dr. John Ubo. Praise the Lord. Let's be seated. Thank you so much, media. I am so scared to stand here right now after that introduction and also after... Pastor Stardivan just left this altar. You know, there are times when people like your father stand somewhere. Growing up, it's so difficult for you to stand there. Amen? But thank you so much for such an honor and such a privilege to stand here. And I pray that God and his mercy will help me do what I'm supposed to do in the name of Jesus. And that God will bless you, anoint you, and cover you in the mighty name of Jesus. I would like to thank uh, my dear father in the Lord. I call him my big brother, Pastor Joe Tacon, his wife, uh, for giving me such an honor. I mean, this is not a joke. I don't take it for granted. Uh, thank you so much. I know he's probably with Pastor Stoudivan, but thank you so much, Ma. Thank you, leaders of this church, for giving me such an honor to stand here. Um, I don't know if I can match what just happened here a minute ago. So, and that's not my plan to try to match it. I'm only called to say, how do you balance ministry with work and life in a marketplace? And I pray that God will speak through me in the name of Jesus and speak through my heart and touch your heart in Jesus' name. I'm not preaching at you because it's not possible. You're all ministers. You're all doing this job already. Because if you understand, God uses ordinary people to do great things. And it gives you a lot of gifting to do a lot of mighty things on his behalf. The old Levitical order is completely gone now, where you had high priests, priests, Levites. And the whole church had to take care of them. But now God takes care of, uses ordinary people. So don't see yourself as ordinary. God can use you. God can do great things in your life in the mighty name of Jesus. Let's bow our heads even as we pray this morning or afternoon. Father, Lord, of God, we just come before you. We commit this time in your presence, O oh God, to you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Thank you for such a privilege to stand before your altar, to stand before your people, Lord God, anointed and covered by your grace. I pray, Father, Lord, my God, that you speak through me, O oh God Almighty. Use my lips, use my heart, use my spirit, O oh God Almighty, in the name of Jesus. I humble myself, O oh Lord, my God, under your mighty hand this afternoon, Father. And I pray, God, that you will speak. Speak a word, O oh God, in season to everyone who would hear me. Hear locally and those who are online, God, in Jesus' name. Let your will be done, Father, Lord God, above all things, O oh God. For in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Praise the Lord. I know my time is already gone. I've never, I've not even started. But hey, praise God. Now they're talking about balance, creating balance between ministry and the workplace. One of the most difficult things 
you can ever do. I don't know if there's any man I know or woman I know who has ever achieved that balance. I've not, I've not seen one. Have you, met, have you met one? Somebody who works full-time ministry because many people think that if you're in full-time ministry, you have to have a profession. You have to be professionally a pastor. You cannot hold a secular job. And that's a lie. Because a lot of the work that has been done in most churches across the world is being done by people who hold a full-time job and also a ministry. True or false? That's a fact. And I see myself as a grace, as an example to a lot of young people, a lot of people are older, that God can still use you, irrespective of your calling, irrespective of the offices you hold. People don't understand how difficult it is. This weekend, actually, I was supposed to be in Michigan for a conference. When Pastor uh, Takon called me and said, John, I want you to say, I said, yes, sir. Because it's like a father to me. I've, do, I've only said no to him once as long, since I've known him in 27 years. And that time when I said no, because I was supposed to do something else that is so important, I said, sir, yes, sir, I will be here. I canceled that thing. This morning, I was supposed to be somewhere again. Yesterday evening, I was supposed to be somewhere. And you have to balance those things. I had a full clinic all the way till about 7 p.m. I was in a hospital since someone was sick. I left that place. I came home at 8 p.m. Not knowing that my daughter was inviting friends to the house. I mean, your, your daughter invites friends to their house. You, as a father, have to be fatherly. And when you're fatherly, your eyes have to be open. You are praying, you are trusting God that nothing crazy happens. At the same time, you are standing awake. And I'm supposed to be preparing for a meeting the next day. I stayed fatherly till about past 12 midnight, and I said, Father, Lord God, deliver me. Amen? Now, what I'm trying to say this because there's a balance between ministry, a work life, and also being a parent are some of the most difficult things anybody can ever, uh, you know, try to do. It's almost impossible because if you look at the dictionary, dictionary definition of balance, let me just pull my notes here. The, a dictionary definition of balance, you know, this is the first time I'm using a, um, this thing to preach. I like my exercise book. So forgive me. So to keep doing all kinds of crazy stuff, but that's okay. Praise God. Now, a, the word balance means a condition in which different elements are equal or in correct proportions. And I've never seen where you can have ministry, you can have a secular life, and you can have a family life in equal proportions. It's not possible. Instead, I saw another definition. And that definition says, an even distribution of weight. Hold on. An even distribution of weight enabling someone or something to remain upright and steady. And I saw it and I said, ah, this is what God was saying me to say. After writing four pages of preamble, God said, I was in the shower. God said, hey, calm down. Because you can never balance it. Instead, there are times when the needs of ministry come. There are times when the needs of family come. There are times when the needs of work come. But you have to Closely, slowly shift the balance. When you have a weight, there are times when God will move, move things and you shift the balance this way, shift the balance this way, and God alone gives the wisdom. God alone gives the understanding. And But the Bible says with God, all things are possible. And you have to learn the art of shifting weights from one balance here to the next balance so that it doesn't tilt you and tip you over. This morning, we heard a lot already from Pastor Sturdivant, about how life can run on empty. It's so easy for men of God, women of God, who get into trouble, and you can get into trouble, especially when you're running on empty. Because everybody is seeing you. Your life is in the open. Everybody thinks that you have everything, but you have nothing. Instead of going back to God and say, God, help me. Help me. Get me to where you want me to get to. Praise the Lord. Now, let's go back down to my talk. Now, I'm talking this morning, brethren. Don't think I'm an expert in this. I have stumbled across life, made a lot of mistakes. But I'm going to try and share a couple of things that I've learned to do that have helped me to stay sane and stay balanced. As I'm standing here by the grace of God, right now, I'm a full-time pastor. I call myself a full-time pastor. I was ordained here in the Redeemed Christian Church of God since 98. 
I've been in ministry since the, in the 80s. I've been in missionary work in different parts of the world, in Malaysia, in places where I will be finishing from surgery. They'll call me and I have to preach in four different places. Now, trying to balance that has been very, not, not an easy task. In this same town, every single thing my senior pastor tells me to do, I do. If you go to Family Praise Chapel today where I walk under Pastor Adifila, if you see the shrubs in the garden, every single shrub in that church, I planted along with one other, past, one other person. If they tell me to do it, I say, yes, sir. Every toilet in that church I have washed. I've acted as a youth leader. I've acted as a children's leader. I've acted as an usher. I've acted every single thing. As long as you stay under the grace of God and you do what you're supposed to do, God has a way of identifying you and lifting you up. Then the same capacity, brethren, the same person who's working in ministry. I, am, I run two practices. I'm the chief of orthopedic surgery at the Atlanta VA Medical Center, and I have my practice also at Emory Hospital. I'm an examiner for the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons. I also write. I publish everything you can imagine. I'm an adjunct professor at, M, at Morehouse School of Medicine. I'm just, I can keep listing them, listing them. How do you balance all of this except by the grace of God? Now, why am I listing all of these things? Because I know that even Priscilla and Aquila and Paul ran both a secular job and they were doing ministry at the same time. So that's why I found that in my life that it is possible. And if it is possible, I trust God that even in your life it is possible. So how do I create a balance? Because of time, let me just share a couple of things with you. The first thing I found that over time, because I struggled. What I'm saying, please listen to me. I struggled with all of these things I'm saying to you right now before I got to where I am and I'm still struggling with them. All my life I'm struggling with them because I know that the Bible says that with God all things are possible. And the thing about God is that the Bible says that his strength is perfected in our weakness. Whenever you struggle, whenever you feel that you're failing in an area, that's when God comes in. And God lifts you up and enables you in the name of Jesus. Praise the Lord. So the first thing I do for myself now is that I learned, I have learned over the time to focus on the gifting and calling of God in my life. Because if you don't understand and define what God has called you to do very early, everyone around you would define your calling for you. I live like that. Everyone. I live in this town. There's no part in this town in this Atlanta that I've not been to. Everywhere they tell me do, I say do. I run. Marriage, every marriage, I'm there. Every baby dedication, I'm there. Everything I do, I'm there. Every, I ran around like crazy until a time when God said, John, calm down. First Corinthians 12, verse 29. He says, are you all pastors? Are you all apostles? Are you all this? And God says, eh, eh. it's not possible. So it said, learn very early to define what? Your calling. And focus on your calling and your gifting. If you don't understand your gifting, you don't know your calling, Everyone else would define it for you. I'm telling you. There was a time, brethren, when I thought to myself that performance would gain me respect from the church, from work, from so many things. I learned that over time, no matter what you do, people will forget. Because people are fickle. Until you learn to stick to what God called you to do, you'll be irrelevant. You'll be so, your energy will be wasted, but you'll be relevant. So I learned early in my life that God has called me to teach. God has called me into the ministry of helps. So I learned, I read, I studied, I did everything I could to make myself better in these areas of my calling. So that I will not do the job of someone else. If you know, I was ordained at the same time with a lot of our provincial pastors. And they say, every time they come and say, Pastor Joe, you're still here? I say, Yes. I'm still here because I am the most satisfied and the most blessed pastor you can ever meet. I am so grateful to God. I'm so grateful to God. I'm doing the things that God called me to do in my own little capacity. If you come into a room, brethren, you have some flowers on the wall. You have some picture on the wall. You have everything in the world. Every single one of those things serve a function. If your calling is to stay on the wall, stay on the wall because God has put you there for a purpose. Learn to live within your calling. 
our life does not consist of the abundance of the things we do or have in the church or at work. Don't let work, don't let ministry define you. Define yourself by the calling of God on your life. Jesus Christ came here three years and was gone. Every single one, I'm telling you, came, did their job, and we're gone. Because why am I saying this this morning? Listen to me. Pastor Sturdivant said something, like he took my message. Uh-uh. I said, God, okay, I can't say the things he said. I can't repeat them any longer. He says, why? We should always remember to go back to a point and check ourselves. Why is the oil dry? Why? Why did the oil dry up? Why did the anointing dry up? Why did the grace depart from someone's life? Because many of us are so scattered. Energy is so scattered into things that God has not called you to do. The second point, because I have to try and finish them for me. I can spend all day talking about each of these principles that I'm trying to deliver to you today. Because I'm a, that's what I do. I, I, I like to put stuff together, A, B, C, and I can build, 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 build upon it. Amen? The second point I've, I came to understand is that once you make your focus and your calling very clear, be clear, number two, be clear about the expectations. Expectations are the demands you place on yourself and the demands you allow people to place on you. Hello? What did I say? Expectations are what? The demands you place on yourself and the demands you place on, uh, you allow your church or people around you to place on you. But why am I saying this? Because do you know that 80% of the time, 80% percent. All the studies have shown that 80 percent of the time expectations are never expressed. That's why we have conflicts. Everybody thinks, expects, 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 but they never what? They never say it. They want you, they, they want you to be a man reader. They expect you. I'm telling you, what, look, if you don't speak out, somebody else will speak out for you. I'm telling you. You may not be ready. Listen to me. When you have a job and you're in ministry, it's impossible for you to be readily available for church work as someone who is full-time. But everybody around you does not think that way. I learned because I'm telling you, I'm sitting here and talking to you. I had to deal with the issues of what I call society's disrespect or society's acceptability. Because everybody thought that I need to be where they want me to be every single time, forgetting that I have a job. Everyone, they get angry. You are supposed to be here. You know, I said, don't know. I have a wife, I have four children, and I have a job. Brethren, if you don't understand something, did you know this thing I called? At the times I will be in surgery, I will just walk out of the room. My phone will ring. And the person said, do you have a minute? Do you have a minute to become one hour? And at times, I've been looking through that small door in the operating room. My patient is on the table. I have residents waiting for me to teach them to, to finish the surgery. I have people waiting. For, I say, excuse me, they know I'm the head of the section. So they will say, okay, sir. But I have to talk to somebody. I have came to a point in my life where I said, excuse me. There must be balance. Do you have a minute should be at certain times of the day? At other times of the day, the person that is paying for my job right now should be respected and should be balanced. Do you have a minute to not be? Do you have a minute? Otherwise, you will have a minute for everybody in the world except yourself. Amen? Now, what am I saying here? I'm saying, look, I struggled with this all for so long. And I still struggled with it. Look at me, the second king. So that I'm not just talking about principles. Let's look at the Bible. Second Kings chapter 5. You all know the story. Verse 1 to 2 and, chapter, and verse 9 to 12. It talks about a man called Naaman. You all remember that story? Naaman came because a young lady told Naaman that there was a man, a prophet of God in Israel who could what? Bring healing to him. So when Naaman, in all of his glory, came to this man, the Bible says that Naaman said indeed to himself that he expected the man of God to come from where he was, come down, do what? 
wave his hand and do certain things so that he will be healed. The man of God starts to see where he stayed, he was. He said, go to this water and wash yourself. Nehemiah was very angry. The thing about expectations is that if you do not define expectations placed on you and expectations that you put, you will cause a lot of problems and you will not go far in ministry. Make it clear. It's impossible. One thing I've come to find out, brethren, it's impossible for you to live your life perpetually for everybody. You will burn out. The oil will dry up. Jesus Christ said something in John chapter 2. In, 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 the, in the wedding of Cana. You all remember that story? The wedding of Cana. The mother of Jesus came to Jesus and said, Jesus, why don't you what? Turn this water into wine. Jesus Christ looked at her. He said, what has your trouble? What is your concern? Your concern cannot be what? My Concern because my time is not here. Not, I pray that somebody cut that in Jesus' holy name. Stop trying to live your life because of the presence of people. It's a mistake. It's a mistake. I'm talking about the balance. We talked about focus. Now we're talking about expectations. Jesus Christ, the Bible says in John 2:24. John 2:24. He says Jesus did not allow the people to determine his purpose. Because he knew what was in their hearts. All they were interested in is bring food, bring food, bring food. They chased him all around the town. Bring food, bring food. But Jesus Christ said, eh, eh, I know these people. I know what's in their hearts. And the scripture said that he did not completely give himself over to them. Because he understood that if he does that, there will be a mistake. Amen? Brethren, ministry is not yours. It belongs to God. What did I say? Ministry is what? Not yours. It belongs to God. He alone is the one that rewards. So deal with the issues of expectations early. There are times you need to manage expectations by negotiating. When you're in a church or in a ministry, learn the art of negotiating what you can do, what you cannot do. Even you look at what did Abraham do? He negotiated with God. If you find 10 people, would you destroy God said, eh, no, if you find five people, do you destroy? No, God listens. God understands. Don't kill. Don't destroy yourself. Number three principle. One, focus. Two, expectations. Number three, I'm talking about how do you create a balance? Shifting the balance because life can be so rigorous. Life can throw you a curveball. There are times when you're in ministry and then family issues come up. You have to readjust. Am I making sense? You have to readjust to create a balance so that you don't tip over. That's what the definition means. The third principle I've come to see is number three, is humble yourself before God and be accountable to other people. One of the biggest problems we have in Christianity today. Every young person is in a rush. Every person in ministry is in a rush. Everyone wants to be seen in public. Who are you accountable to? Who are you accountable to? Many young people live in isolation. You remember what Pastor Sturdivant just said? He said one of the biggest mistakes that the prophet made when he was running from, you know, um, the, the, uh, Jezebel. What did he do? He left his servant behind in Bethesda. He left his servant. You know, the people that God has put in your life in the times of distress, you leave them behind. When you leave them behind, you will suffer. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. Do you know that every man who's been successful in life, successful in combining ministry and a secular job, had people they were accountable to? David had Hushai. You remember Hushai? And Ahitophel. Though Ahitophel had his own plan. You know, we all talk about Ahitophel, Ahitophel, Ahitophel. Ahitophel had his own plan. Because his relative, Abigail, you know, his husband was killed. So he planned. He stayed under for a long time until the time came to hit David. Look at the history. But Hushai was there. The Bible said that the voice and the counsel of those people was like the voice of God. I pray that young people in this place, you will understand. Many times, brethren, you don't know how you're walking except somebody who's walking behind you. Do you know there was a story, there, used to, there was a movie, they, it's not a movie actually, it's like a show when I was younger, called uh, Village Headmaster. 
For those who are about my age will understand that. Village headmaster, there was a man called Chief Elemi. For those who are young, don't worry about it. There was a way this man walked. When he was going to his throne, he walked like this. When he walked, before he gets to the throne, he walked back again. He walked about, and there was a way they used to say, he says, they call it Talan Dolo, Talan Dololo, Talan. That the one saying that, brethren, is that only someone walking behind you knows how you're walking. Many of us are in trouble. We don't even know. Because there's nobody looking over us. I thank God, brethren. I will say it. God has put people in my life that if they say, <coughs> I say, yes, sir. One of them is my dear father and other pastor, Pastor Taco. I told him only once that I've told him, sir, I can't come. Pastor will not remember that, but that's okay. Pastor will say, John, there's a vacancy somewhere I want you to go to. I say, yes, sir. He'll come back and say, no, that vacancy is over. I say, yes, sir. I pray that God will give you people in your life that you're listening to. Because God will use them to elevate you and establish you in the name of Jesus. The balance. Now, along with the spiritual fathers that God has put in my life, there are secular fathers. My number one mentor in this country is a Jewish man. Not a Christian. A Jewish man that if he, if he hears that my life is going crazy, I work in a very, very difficult environment, being an orthopedic surgeon, dealing with veterans who have a lot of demands, being just, and being, you know, so, so much stress at times. But there are times when stress gets to this point, and I say, I can't do this no more. And I will say, sir, I am in trouble. I can't do this no more. I'm tired. Guess what? He'll call me in the evening and say, John, what are you doing? I say, I just got home now. He said, what is your wife doing? I just, she, 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 he said, okay, can you all meet me here? Let's have dinner together. That is a man who has no connections with me. He's white and black. He will come. He said, okay, no, 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 no. I'll come to your house. He'll come and pack his house. This man is the vice president of innovations at Emory Healthcare. He is the president of the American Orthopedic Association. He is one of the most powerful orthopedic surgeons in this country. If he calls a name, I will enter anywhere in this country because of this man. Why am I saying this? Because I take him like a father. He knows that if he says I should do something, he will always cover for me. There are people that God has laid in your life that will bring a balance, but you neglect them. Because pride is a problem. Many of us, people, spiritual people, and people who don't know too much, but God has put them in your life. I'm talking about a balance. Don't be a loner. Learn to listen to people above you. Learn to listen to your pastor. Learn. Stay. There are many years, brethren. I walked under the same pastor for 27 years, and I'm still walking there. Because God has not called me to run a church. If I run a church, I will probably kill a couple of people. You may not understand. Don't say, Pastor John is a very gentle person. I am gentle. I love the Lord. There's nothing I will not give for this church. But I know and I know and I know that God is teaching me what they call faithfulness. It's a gifting from God. And I pray that you catch that in Jesus' name. Number four principle. Be careful not to choose a job that is too demanding. If you want to do ministry, you say, what about you? I, I, <laughs> I prayed for this job. Because this job, brethren, I am my own boss. I am in a clinic where I have five, six at times, PAs. They see all my patients and I walk into the room. When I say something, it is final. In the state of Georgia, in Alabama, in South Carolina, all the VA hospitals are under the same vision. They would, at times, would not even get any benefits if I don't put my hand on it. Not because of power, but because I have learned to distribute. And I will explain to you a little bit of how I do it. I've learned by the grace of God to distribute them. Now, why am I saying this? The pay is not good. It's not as good as the pay I would have got it outside. That I'm standing here by the grace of God, brethren. I've worked in ministry in the same church for 27 years. I've not received a dime. 
Many times I go preach in many places, not a single honorarium. And I'm grateful to God. My life only started where I am right now just about 10, 13 years ago. For the last 14 years, brethren, I'm telling you, there was nothing. Many times I come to church, people in the church will give us clothes for my wife and my children to wear. We wash them, iron them, and nobody will know. What's the problem? That's your problem, not my problem. Because I know that when the time comes for elevation, it is God who elevates. With the, day, the day God visited me, brethren, everything happened within one month. Ba, 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 To a point that now people have to look under my tent for salvation, for deliverance. Learn to listen and stay where God has placed you. Money is a trap. If you want to do ministry. I'm standing here, brethren, I'm telling you, as soon as God opened the door for me there, Someone came and called me. He said, I know I've heard so much about you. I've heard this thing. Come, we're going to bump up your pay a little bit. $300,000 extra. You head at the apartment. I said, see, see, they took me, took my wife, took my children, put us on a boat ride. Give us lake house. Give us every opportunity. Everything. They said, you're going to run this department the way you run this. The money. This. I, said, I looked at it and said, ah, Kaduna boy. Something you never see in your life. You think it's, it's not a joke? Oh? They dangle things like this. They say you they multiply extra anything you. I said okay. I looked at it. I looked at my wife. My wife said, "What about church?" I say, "You always stay in Atlanta. Every weekend I'll be coming and doing ministry. As soon as we enter the car on our way back to the airport, I say, God said, uh-uh. this is not for you.' He said, "Leave it alone." Because money is a trap. The people that God has ordained for you to minister to, to hold so that they don't fall and destroy their destinies, you're going to give them away. I said, okay, sir. Mm -mm. I left it alone. I walked away. As soon as I walked away, calls, unbelievable calls, begging me. I said, "Eh -eh, God, I said, not this one. Since then, money here, money there, calling. But I've come to learn that money is a trap. Number five principle. I'm talking about how to balance now. Let God make the decisions for you. Number five principle. Recognize what is most important, especially when it comes to your family. Brethren, if you are working a secular job like me and doing ministry, remember God who comes first. Number two, your family comes first. Next. Number three, your work comes next. Number four, ministry comes next. Some people may disagree with me because, hey, it's a job that is paying my salary, not ministry. How can I say ministry before job? They will sack me. Am I making sense? Now, why am I saying this? Because if you work for me and ministry is forced for you, I will sack you. Period. There are so many of us, we think that we're still in Nigeria. Where a lot of people don't do any job. And they stay in church morning till night. There must be balance. You can still be effective, do the work of God, and create a balance. Amen? Don't steal. Don't steal. Let the people around you respect you. When they respect you. I want to walk into this place, and my patients know that I'm a pastor. When they hear, they say, they, he knew you're a pastor. They searched, they know me. They know that, that I will not lie to them. They know I will not cheat them. I will not take advantage of them. So this ministry this opportunity gives me an opportunity to enter circles that I would never have been able to enter. Don't cheat. Give priority to your family. I have a car that I drive here. It's a Venza. I love the car. You know, people say, why you not buy Porsche? I say, I buy Porsche. But if I leave my Venza, look at how big I am. They, they, Porsche can't carry me. <laughs> but Venza, how many of you have ridden a Venza before? Yeah. You've ridden a Venza. Enter that Venza. It's spread out like this. Completely paid. When I hit the road like this, I'm feeling good with myself. And I'm giving glory to God. Why am I saying that? Listen to me, brethren. Because that Venza has just clocked 100,000 miles. It is 14 years old. Not giving me trouble one day. 100,000 miles. Why 100,000 miles, Venza? Because my circle of life is between church, work, and home. I've learned that as soon as I'm done with work, I should be home. Because I have a wonderful, blessed wife. 
I have a four lovely children that God has given me to minister to. Those people are my priority. Because the scripture says in the book of First Timothy and also in Titus chapter 1, it says that for you to be available for ministry, qualified for your ministry, your family should not fail. If your family fails, you're not qualified. Contrary to what people say. Contrary to what people say around us. I want my family to be example. So if you're going to give an example, say, ah, look at Pastor John. He's able to handle it. God can do it for you. So I look after my wife. I look after my children. I look after... You have you seen my wife? Let's, let's, let's leave that one. Let's leave that one alone. I can talk about that one for a long time. Baba. Don't allow pride, and my next principle, don't allow pride to stop you from doing what is right for you, your family, and the church. There are times when ministry may not be able to pay all the bills. You may have to humble yourself to take something else to handle and create a balance. That's all part of family responsibility. Number seven. Chai, I have 13, six minutes left. I'm a teacher, so forgive me. Amen? Number seven, learn to define boundaries for yourself, your work, and your ministry. There's a time and place for everything under the sun. If you don't have boundaries, everybody's concern will become your concern. God did not call you to carry all the burden of the world. Hello? The Bible says there are times when Jesus Christ came into certain places and some people were not healed. He still went to, uh, did, he, did he go home? Yes. Did he do it? Uh, yes. Did he stop eating? Because God, did he, did he, did he, no, he didn't, he got up where, left. He went to the next door. Somebody got healed. God did not call you to be what? Carry all the burdens of the world. Bread and boundaries for me help us to deal with the huge expectations placed on us daily by the church, by work, by people around us. Especially today, brethren, when you can work from home and Zoom all day. You are Zooming all day. You have no lines drawn. Your family is suffering. Your ministry is suffering. So learn to do what? Learn to draw boundaries. Even Jesus Christ told his mother, I've given you the example already. He said, mother, he said, hey, excuse me. What's your problem? Your concern cannot be my concern. Draw what? Boundaries. People can place bread and such huge demands on your life if you're not careful. Ministry-wise, work-wise, get a balance. So create a balance for your life. Learn to say no when you need to say No. Next principle, because of our time, I would love to say some things about boundaries this morning because I read that book so many times by John Townsend and Henry Cloud. I read it so much. Now, number eight, set a Sabbath for yourself. I beg you, because the day you die, Walmart will still open. They are not going to close 285. Life will still keep what? Going on. Convention, with all due respect, will still occur. Everything will still happen the day you die. Give yourself a break. God ordained it. The owner of the universe, the creator of the universe. The Bible says, after six days of walking in Exodus 31, he said, the Bible says, he, he later rested so that it can be refreshed. He was refreshed. Choose a day. It may not be Sunday because Sunday cannot be Sabbath for a lot of us. We are walking. Hello? Choose a day. Choose a day where we all some time, when you reduce, you know what, what, you know what rest means? Rest for me means a time when there is a reduced expectation to perform. No phone, nothing. Nobody is expecting anything from me to perform. That's rest. I cut off everything, reduce the voice tone on the roof, or throw the phone down in the basement, or just, and then the phone is ringing. I say, I look at my wife, say, mm hmm. Say, what's up, sister? And we're resting. Learn to take time off. 
Learn to do something else. One thing I'm learning in life. But I'm telling you all these things because I stumbled through them in life. I struggled with them. I've learned to what? Learn to hang out with people I agree up with. People who are loving, who, are lo- who love the Lord Jesus Christ. Outside of work, outside of church, I didn't know how to do it. That's why a lot of us pastors I lived some of the most loneliest of lives. We don't know anything else. 27 years in this country, 27 years in ministry, I can count the number of friends I have in my fingertips. Why? But if you know the number of people that God has used me to bless, thousands, but I don't have friends like that. Many pastors live in complete isolation. The people that God puts there, they leave them around and they run. Are you making sense? So I've learned one thing that learn to do what? Bring some people that God has called into your life. Learn. Say, let us go eat somewhere together. So what we do now, every two months or so, I and a couple of friends who are loving Christians, we come and sit down, eat somewhere, and say, how is your life doing? What's going on? What are the mistakes? What are the struggles? And we're speaking to each other's lives. And if you have to play golf, I don't like golf. Because how can grown people with tiny, tiny ball, when can there's bigger ball to chase? Do something that's different. You understand me? Go to something. Train. Do something different with yourselves. Praise the Lord. Learn to Sabbath. Amen. <laughs> Forgive me. Number nine principle. I call it delegate. 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 If you remember Jethro. Jethro, when he came, you know what Moses was? Moses was enjoying himself for so long because his wife and his children were not with him. Hello? Moses was careless in ministry because his wife and his children were not there. He left his wife and children with who? His father-in-law, Jethro. So he was sitting there from morning to where? Night. Doing and counseling and doing everything. But when Jethro came, he brought his wife to him. He said, carry your ludo. He brought his wife and his children to him. When he brought his wife and his children, he said, Moses. He, the Bible said the next day he went and sat around where Moses was doing this thing. And looked at Moses. And this man must have been a Yoruba man. He said, kill day. Look at it. Exodus chapter 18 verse 13. He said, how do you alone sit here all day? See the way the scripture put it. He said, well, how do you sit here all day doing this? He said, you're going to die. So what do you do? Delegate, delegate, delegate. I'm telling you, as I'm standing here by the grace of God, time is gone, but I'm going to be obedient. I have learned, brethren, I told you I did everything my pastor told me to do for so many years. For so many years, I do everything until God in his mercy started helping me. To pick up one or two people. Once one person comes and rec- I recognize a gift, I say you are in charge. The next person comes, I recognize a gift, I say you are in charge. Recently, they told me that um, Pastor Motosho called me and said, Pastor John, I want you to be regional coordinator for Yaya. I say, yes sir, but wait sir. I can recommend some people. And next few days, Pastor John, you, you know what I'm talking about. On the line, they called me and said, I said, I have people who can do this. I called one person. I said, Pastor Muto, I will be behind this person and I will support this person. I know people, I will support this person. And I have people like Pastor John Emmanuel who is involved. I have Pastor Mike. They will be involved. Brethren, that's how my work has blessed me. Everywhere I enter, I say, they say, hand it over to me. I'll be there. I will watch over their shoulders. But somebody else can do it better than me. Why should I be doing something someone else can do better than I can? Hand it over to somebody. You don't have to be in limelight so you don't die. Praise the Lord. And finally, because of my time, because I I can't finish this, you know, learn to be satisfied. That's the conference this day. And satisfaction is learning to be content where you are, in whatever place God has placed you, until God says otherwise. I've learned, because if you look at Apostle Paul, in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1, Apostle Paul says something. He said, let every man consider us to be 
preachers and men of God. Irrespective of what you say or feel about me. He says, I am satisfied and I'm so grateful to God for where I am. Learn the art of satisfaction. Learn the art of contentment. Learn to give God glory until God changes your situation. Let us stand up and pray this morning. We honor you, Lord God, in the name of the Lord Jesus. I told you my plan and my joy is not to match what Pastor Sturdivant did. I'm a teacher, and I pray, God, in the name of the Lord Jesus, that you've learned maybe one thing or the two or three here this morning that perhaps God will use to change your ministry in the name of the Lord Jesus. Above all, we pray that God in this mercy, who has called you, who has helped you or put you where you are, will help you create a balance. And creating a balance, like I told you, this one we started this afternoon, is learning the art of shifting demands from here to there so that God's calling above all will be perfected in your life in the name of Jesus. Let us pray. Father, we just thank you. We honor you, Lord God, in the name of Jesus. I'm a child. Lord God Almighty, what you've spoken through me, Father, I pray that you build upon God in the name of Jesus. And you bring a change, you bring a deliverance, Lord my God, and you cause grace to bear upon your people, Lord God, in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father, Lord God, for your mercy. For in Jesus' mighty name we pray, amen.